Once known as a Malaysian pop icon, Mona Van Dee fell into the darkness of witchcraft and concocted the most gruesome crime in Malaysian history. Although most people thought she was a fake, decades later, her spirit would speak from beyond to prove her last words may not have been so final. As one of the top trending hashtags on Twitter and TikTok in Malaysia, her story was retold to millions across social media platforms, giving her new life and infamy like she always intended. Mona Van Dee was born with the name Nur Mazna Ishmael on January 15, 1956 in Kangar Federation of Malay. During her childhood, she showed a deep passion for singing. Her dream was to be a Malaysian superstar. She was also a water ballet dancer, with enough talent to have her routines broadcasted across television for the world. In her early 20s, she changed her name to Mona Van Day and released her first album titled Diana One and her hit single Ku Nayanakin Lagu Ini. She married Mohammed Noor Afandi Abdul Rahman, who promised her fame. But like most musicians, her one hit wonder came and went leaving her penniless and searching for a better means of income, ultimately discovering a different type of performance, witchcraft. Known as one of the largest money-making opportunities at the time, Mona used witchcraft as a shaman and medicine woman, known in Malaysian culture as a bamo, to offer elite services, claiming she could provide people with money and success they longed for. She had several high-profile clients who would pay her large sums of money, which led her and her husband to spend frivolously on mansions, luxury cars, and shopping sprees. This once poor woman was now making an insane amount of money and spending it faster than the speed of her fancy BMWs. The Bamo culture in Malaysia is closely tied to Islam. They use the Quran and claim to follow Islamic teachings. Conventional religious leaders condemn the idea of these witch doctors, but communities still believe in their folklore to this day. Many Bomos remain as small village shamans, but Mona wanted something more. There are widely known Bomos, similar to Christianity's televangelists, spewing religious jargon on television and providing prosperity spells for cash. In Malaysia, Mona stood out from the crowd, as most Bomos at the time were old men and she was a young, sprite woman. In early 1993, a state assemblyman named Maslan Indris approached Mona in the hopes that she could boost his political career. Mona claimed he could become invincible if he possesses three relics, a staff, a songok, and a talisman, owned by the first president of Indonesia, Sukarno. Maslam promised to pay Mona and her husband 2.5 million ringgit, about 600,000 US dollars, to own these items. He ended up giving them a combination of a fifth of that plus 10 land deeds. In July 1993, the deal was finally made, and Maslam planned to visit Mona for the ritual that would make him successful. After leaving his kids and wife at home in the early morning of July 2nd, he drove to the small rural village of Kampung Peruas. When Maslan arrived at Mona's dilapidated home, she told him to lie on the floor and close his eyes. She instructed him to imagine money falling from the sky as she placed flowers around his body. As she put him into this calm, meditative state, she had her assistant, Jiraimi Husan, grab an axe and slice his neck, removing his head completely from his body. It was also mentioned that Mona and her henchmen performed an evil occult ritual on the body afterwards. The trio then skinned Maslan's body, dismembered him into 18 pieces, and buried him under Mona's home. To finalize the atrocity, they poured concrete over the top of the hole they had dug. I guess this is what happens when you make a deal with a devil that you just can't fulfill. In July of 1993, Maslan was reported missing after missing several party engagements in his constituency of Batu Talam, but police had no leads. 
His disappearance became front page news as police discovered that he had withdrawn 300,000 ringgit or roughly 70,000 US dollars from his bank account at multiple branches in Kuala Lumpur. Many people thought he was just an old man who had gone off for some time alone, but his family and friends knew he wouldn't blow off his commitments. As weeks went by without resolve, whispers of a supernatural suspicion became abundant. However, the police were working towards a more logical solution and negated the ideologies that he had been taken by a demonic force. That was until Drymi was arrested on unrelated drug charges after police found him belligerent in the streets. In his delusion, Drymi thought he was being arrested for the murder of Maslan and confessed to the entire event. Drymi expressed everything to the police, including where they can find Maslan's body in the jungle and who helped him commit the heinous crime. Unbeknownst to Drymi's confessions, Mona and her husband splurged on a new Mercedes, clothes, and jewelry, all paid in cash. She had even paid for a facelift in full, hoping she could make it back to her once pop star youth. The trio was trialed with murder, and a three-month trial ensued. Throughout the trial, Mona acted like this was her greatest achievement in her life. She showed up to every hearing with a huge smile on her face and donned designer clothing. She would stop for reporters and pose for photographs, claiming she had many fans. Journalist Esther Ng covered the story for the star and described Mona as, handcuffed the ever smiling Bomo nodded to the three of us, who covered the injury the year before and spooked us by saying, you, you, and you. I know you, Appa Kabar. Don't think I have forgotten your names. Much to our discomfort, she didn't. Her infamy took over when someone yelled, Mona, I love you, from the crowd of watchers as she entered the court. Similar to the Joker, she smiled even larger in a manic manner. She also asked the judge if they wanted her autograph and told onlookers that she came from a royal family, which was completely untrue. During another part of the trial, while the pathologist was describing the remains found at Mona's home, a booming, groaning sound erupted throughout the courtroom, similar to a loud duck call. Many people ran from the courtroom in fear that they would be cursed by Mona themselves. One newspaper ran a story the following day with interviews of Mona's neighbors, stating that they had heard the same sound come from her decrepit home and her other mansions. Finally, in April 2001, the trio were found guilty, and their death sentences were set for November 2, 2001. When the verdict was read, Mona hugged and kissed her husband, then told the crowd, I'm happy with the decision. I want to thank all Malaysians. I love all the people. Throughout the Kajang prison, people gossiped about Mona and her ties to witchcraft. Both criminals and correctional officers would claim that strange things happened within Mona's cell, including objects moving by themselves, weird sounds, and creepy dreams. Many also said to have seen her roaming the prison freely at night. However, all the black magic in the world could not save Mona, her husband, or Drymi. They hosted their closest family and friends for an eight-hour event while the couple spoke to their children, telling them to move on with their lives and live honorably. They also refused to have a last meal. At 5.59 a.m., the trio was brought out to the gallows where they were hanged, leaving their bodies there for over an hour. In her final moments, Mona uttered her last words, I will never die. Although some believes that this is where Mona's story ended, it was just the beginning of her afterlife. There's a lot of talk regarding Malaysian folklore and the stories of the forests. The dark, secluded areas around the country are said to be homes to the worst of all evils. Sightings of creatures who drink your veins dry and steal your soul are abundant. Even in modern times, these superstitious stories are a major part of Malaysian culture. One of Mona's abandoned mansions had become a hotspot for ghost hunters. Rumors say that the location is so haunted that even some of the most revered paranormal experts will not enter the home. Many have said that they've seen Mona's spirit roaming the halls and peering out the windows. Others have reported that they've seen her spirit lurking around the prison where her life ended. 
Investigators have also felt bad energy in the rubble of the former jungle abode where Mazlan and his family lived when the crime occurred, also stating they heard a voice asking them what they were doing there and demanding that they leave. Now, whether or not you believe in the paranormal, many cultures hold deep folklore that evokes wonder, fright, and disbelief. Along with these stories come people who take an idea and run in the opposite direction with it, like the makers of the film Dukun. These amateur filmmakers decided to elaborate on Mona's story, which led to a battle with her family over their dissatisfaction with how she was portrayed by popular Malaysian actress Yumi Ada. Although the film was made in 2006, censorship caused it to be shelved for over a decade until it was released in 2018. This case left a massive impact on Malaysian media, culture, and the legal system. The chaos of the events that took place in the courtroom over the course of those three months was partly to blame when Malaysia abolished trial by jury. Officials claimed that there were issues getting the public to attend jury duty and that many people were easily manipulated by the defense teams. There was also mention that the jury system doesn't work in a multiracial country like Malaysia, as it could lead to racial bias. Ironically, America deals with a lot of the same issues in its trials. Jury members are often swayed by the media or ethnic biases, which has caused over 50% of prisoners in America to be a person of color. In recent years, Mona's infamy has been reignited across social media. With many Malaysian people becoming tired of corrupt, money-hungry politicians, they've turned Mona into a meme and a symbol of the revolt against corruption. Although her legacy was a dark one, it shines a light on the errors that plague the judicial systems of the world, causing younger generations to rethink political agendas. What do you think about Malaysia's most horrific crime? Let us know in the comments. Do you believe that Mona's spirit still roams the prison where she died or her old mansion? How do you feel about Malaysia's abolishment of trial by jury caused by this crime? As always, don't forget to click that notification bell, like the video, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time.